All right. Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Startup Studio Show with Raj and Seth, where we interview people who build startups. How are you doing, Raj? Man, I can't complain, dude. I mean, wouldn't help. Nobody's listening. So I guess we're good. <laughs> well, someday, one day, right? But yeah, I'm, I'm super grateful to have our next guest, Nicholas Ayala, who Nick and I go pretty way back in terms of when we started in our own individual careers and our, I guess, our interest in entrepreneurship around the same time. So um, I'm super excited to, to hear that story. I've followed his career around for, it's been about 10 years, I think, since we, we first worked together. And you know, I know he's been a part of some awesome, awesome teams, which we're going to learn more about. But hey, thanks again for joining us, Nick. Yeah, thanks for having me. i um, excited to just have, have this candid conversation about all things startups. Yeah, absolutely. So before we get started, I'm super excited to also introduce my boy, Raj, who I think you're going to have fun like hearing about. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I did a little bit of research prior to the show. I saw that you're also up in Seattle. So I'm I'm up here as well. Oh, beautiful. Man, we should grab a coffee or something. Absolutely. I love it. Yeah, You want to introduce yourself, Raj? Oh, yeah. Hey, Nick, what's going on, brother? I'm super excited to catch up with you, hear all the fun stuff. Seth sings, you know, your praise ad nauseum. I lucked out. I'm a non-technical founder. So my background actually started at Goldman Energy Investment Banking down in Houston. I left after about, you know, less than a year because I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Cobbled a few shekels together. And after about 12 years, I built out a hedge fund, a derivative shop. Our PKUM was about a billion eight and we exited in 15 back to Goldman, then kind of turned into a dad, just kind of retired and moved to Jackson Hole, got extremely bored and followed my passion in health and wellness, and then built out a direct consumer kind of brick and mortar model, and then kind of deploying, you know, assets across Seattle, and then it turned into a SaaS solution. So for the past two years, kind of been building out a really fun tech platform. That's how I met Seth. He helped me really kind of pull my head out of my butt. And it's still really, really far up there. But, you know, a Texan moving to Seattle without any technology background, didn't graduate from MIT, went to Tulane and played, you know, I played ball, went to LSU, like, don't have ex Amazonian, ex Googler, ex, I don't have ex anything, to be honest. And then, you know, you move up to Seattle, and it's just a bunch of bros. And I'm like, so it's been really fun understanding the ecosystem. You know, it's been it's been fun across the board, but excited to kick it off, man. Yeah, definitely. I, I, I've been up here for two years and up in Seattle, and I'm still trying to you know, get the lay of the land up here. So honestly, we're like barely kissing three. So I'm with you. There we go. Nice. Where'd no, you come we're, from? We're... Yeah, Nick, where'd you come from? I was in the San Francisco Bay Area for 25 plus years. Yeah, see, I love you too. I love you Cali kids. I'm talking Texas. I'm talking like butthole Texas. Like <laughs> we don't even have, like we're still losing 64-bit Nintendo and stuff. So <laughs> <laughs> no, well, we're going to definitely get that story. But I think that that's a good segue into getting us started. Like, so who is Nicholas Ayala? Yeah, definitely. When I kind of think about it, I think I put like Curious Wanderer is probably like the best way to kind of summarize that. And what I mean by that is I think over the past, you know, 10 plus years of, you know, being out of college and figuring things out, those have been kind of the two things that have really drove me to get involved in everything that I've been been getting involved. I'll kind of wind it back. So I was born in Southern California at a super young age. My parents moved up to the San Francisco Bay Area. That's where I went through my K through 12 and then eventually went um, to San Jose State University. And that's how I met Seth. But kind of even prior to that part, I think in that high school time is when I started learning about Bill Gates. And I was like, oh, he was a college dropout. He, he, if he could do it, I, I could do it. I, I don't need to go to college. And so I kind of, you know, played that along with my parents for a little bit, missed the deadlines for all the UCs. And, and at the time, right, I had like a 3.9, almost 4.0 GPA. I was in all the accelerated classes. Like I, I should be going to college, but, you know, I was uh, a little bit over my skis a little bit. And the last day before the Cal State University applications were due, my dad was like, you're going to sit down and apply to four schools. And I was like, but, but dad, I don't, I don't need that. Like Bill Gates was able to do it. I could do it. And he's like, you know what? I'll give you the option to go, but at least you have the option. So applied, applied to four different places and got in, you know, fast forward a little bit. I was off to college and it wasn't a choice, but I, I, you know, looking back, I think it was one of those things that I definitely appreciate that my parents stepped in and didn't let me kind of make that decision just because it, it really opened my eyes, right? Like I was out of the house for the first time making new friends, having to learn how to navigate everything from social groups, what I wanted to do, 
what the finances, right? Like paying, paying my own stuff for the first time, not having to just go home and be like, yeah, I need 20 bucks for gas. And then started getting involved in, so like out of the gate, I was like, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I, I got to make this stuff work. So and, I'm kind of curious, like at that young age, right? Before college, where you kind of made that decision already for yourself that, you know, I want to try a business. What yeah. kind of, what kind of businesses were you considering at the time? And, oh, and was, your, point. was your family in, the, in, you know, what was it like the background of your family? Because it's usually the entrepreneur, like you see the entrepreneur who sees the entrepreneur, who's in the, you know, or it's like, actually, I'm a lawyer. Yeah, no, that's a good point. So my mother works at AAA and not non entrepreneurial kind of thing, just nine to five. My dad was a mechanic for BART through and through until he retired. So not a ton on the entrepreneurial side, but one thing that my parents really always stressed was, always kind of question things, you know, don't, and Seth definitely probably knows this is I'll say why to almost set the end of any statement that's ever made in like a conversation. Like if someone can't back it up with a rational reason for why they're making that statement or things like that, like it, if they can't back it up, I'm most likely not even going to take what they're saying for like fact, right? At that point, it's, it's opinion. Or there's like a lack of thought that sometimes comes with what they're saying. And then that was something that was instilled at a really, really young age, which got me into, into some trouble, especially, you know, in, in high school, you know, I was like, oh, senior prank. Well, we're going to make some Loctite contracts. We'll have everyone that participates sign it. We're going to make sure that no one's getting suspended for anything. Cause like the year prior to that, people got in trouble. And then, you know, when the VPs came, they're like, you can't park your cars in the middle of campus. I'm like, I mean, there's nothing that says we can't, and we kind of have all of our like things all tied <laughs> up. So like we're, we're, we're good here. I don't see the problem. But yeah, it, it's just at that young age, my dad is always the type of person that's like, question it. And so I think that I took that for what it was, you know, when I was going to college, I was like, oh, okay, I'm going to question it. And then, you know, he kind of put me in my place. But, you know, over and over again, that that kind of threaded through. I think another part, so coming out of middle school, I, okay, so if I, if I were to ever say like, where did I get my leadership skills from? World of Warcraft raid leading back in the day when that was like a big thing. Yeah. So I did that all through middle school. I was a nerd, right? Taking apart computers, playing video games, doing that whole thing. S sophomore year of high school, I remember seeing on campus, there were all these kids that would walk around in suits and they were like the, the low key hot shit, right? And so I was like, who are these kids? So I found out they're all part of this organization called DECA, which for those that aren't familiar, it's basically like a business fraternity for high school students. And they go to these competitions, they compete against other schools within the state, within the US, and then also internationally against their international chapters. And you have to qualify for each level. So I was like, wow, that's, that's kind of cool. So applied for it, got in my junior year. And at first, when I first joined it, I was just there just to meet girls at other high schools. Because, you know, when when you're in high school at that time, you, your mind's a little somewhere else. And I was like, this is great. Like, I, I get to meet everybody everywhere else. But at the end of that year, when we went to the state competition, I remember coming back in the bus. And like, so Castro Valley High at the time was one of the top ranked schools. And so kids actually took this stuff super, super seriously. Like I, I tanked it. it they, they rate you on like a, a scale of a hundred for your, your competition. I think I got like 30 my first year, but I saw the, all the other like kids that were in the chapter, they, they were like super, super sad when they didn't qualify for like state or internationals. And I didn't really like realize it, but I remember I went up to the teacher and I was like, you know, next year I'm going to go to internationals. She's like, yeah, right. Like I, I saw how you were this year. That, that is not going to happen. But all through senior year, senior year, I made it happen. So I competed in the technical sales event. At the time, the prompt was basically like GPS, Garmin's, all that stuff was kind of new, right? Like everyone would like throw that like weighted sandbag anchor on your, your dashboard, right? For the, the GPS. And so the prompt was hypothetically, what if a company like a FedEx adopted this? How would it optimize, how would it optimize the deliveries? And you had to compete, like what was the best products out there? What would you sell it for? What is the price? What is the return? How does it optimize the process? And then there's a panel of judges that will like basically rate you on those things. Um, so yeah, I took it super seriously the next year, ended up qualifying. So I placed top 16 in the internationals that year. And I think that was like the, the switch of that 
I can, I can do something like I could actually do something. And that, it, it low key built a little bit of that cockiness or, or that or same like, thought process. <laughs> yeah. Like Seth, remember me when I was like super young, I was kind of a hothead, <laughs> right? Like I think all of us kind of had that going for us as well. Like tech bros before tech bros became cool, man. That was, uh, yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> but I think that, that that's what those, those little building blocks is. I think what kind of set me up for by the time I got into college, I was ready to try some stuff. And so what, what was the thought process behind like the, your major then in college? So looking back at when I applied for college, my dad, when he sat me down to have me apply, he was like, you're going to be an engineer. I think it's a little bit of that, you know, Asian household. You only have three options when you grow up. Um, All of us choose one. <laughs> uh, so yeah. Engineer. <laughs> Doctor over here. <laughs> Doctor, lawyer, engineer, maybe nurse, right? Like it's, it's about it. So yeah, I, I went to San Jose State for computer engineering, but then sophomore year switched out to management information systems. Let's see, Di- diving into to like the college area. First week, joined the Entrepreneurial Society. I don't know if you remember Stephen Gurr guy. He was over at WePay, which later got acquired by, I think, JP Morgan Chase or something like that. So got involved there. And I think there was two things that kind of drove me at the time. One, hustler mentality, because I was broke. And so I had to make some money. So you had to be a little creative for that. And then the second piece was just like, seeing things like that at we pay so raj some some background on this so the entrepreneurial Did society you say we pay yeah we pay at the time have you heard of it what's we pay okay so well i'll, I'll double click on that one for no sure. the, po- the payment processing system yeah but at the time it was a like group cost splitting app <laughs> this is like 2005 <laughs> <laughs> it, it was like no fucking way that's it, how it, i remember that app yeah. like you could split a bill e- exactly yeah it was because they went like to like a camping trip could... <laughs> is it the same one that's now with jp morgan absolutely <laughs> i use so, sorry, pay, yeah, 2011 pay... sorry sorry <laughs> awkward because I, u- I use we pay is it still active today jp morgan uses it I didn't know that. I thought they acquired it and kind of like absorbed it. They acquired it and I directly deal with we pay people. Okay. Yeah. So like, I, I don't we'll know. Sorry, 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 sorry. Seth, Cause I was like, I was like, did you say we pay? Like I just switched over from like our banking system, like Heartland to we pay last week. Oh my goodness. Interesting. Well, I, I can't wait to hear. Yeah. Shout out so, to the SJSU entrepreneurships or yeah, the ES. Um, yeah. So they, they had a, like a organization or group. It was like start. They did, they just call it a startup tour. And one of the professors on campus was an angel investor. So what they did during that trip was they would take you to a number of early stage funded startups. You get to sit and talk with the founders and then it ended by taking you to YC. So Y Combinator, you got to talk to one of the group partners at that time. And on that trip, we, Jack Abrams from Milo, which is now, you know, he's pretty active in the Miami scene. That was one of the ones that we went and saw. We talked to Richard. So Richard and Bill started WePay. We talked to Richard through Steven to, to sit and talk with him. And then one of the YC partners now that did Triple Byte, he was doing another startup at the time. Harj Hagar, I think is his name. Mm-hmm. He was the the third founder that that we had a chance to, to speak with at, at that time. But seeing that opened my eyes to like the tech side of it. So it's that mixture of like, I needed a hustle to make some money. And then these are people that were hustling and making something out of it was beyond just inspiring. Yeah, that at that time, like, wow, that that would have been an awesome tour to not only be a part of, but then to also have access to those founders who are clearly like San Jose State University a lot of people don't know, but in tech is one of the biggest feeder schools. Even I think the number one, the highest number of actual CEO alumni are from San Jose State University in Silicon Valley. So you get you got a lot of people just trying, but back in the day, it was a lot of these like 
really old school, just like campus groups that were the, you know, people were, uh, I remember the, the classroom where ES used to have their kind of meetups, but it was nothing like, nothing fancy. So that's, that's awesome to hear. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Freshman year, so kind of with that hustler mentality, I, I tried a lot of things. I had a link, what do they call it? They, I had an affiliate farm before Google changed the algorithm to basically shadow ban affiliate farms. That one was called Falcon Finds back in the day, where basically I just signed up with a bunch of affiliate programs. And it was just one page with a bunch of affiliate codes on there. Brought in some money. It was enough to like, you know, buy some random stuff. I did a book rental company for a while. You got this one I actually found recently on Facebook, the, the old school Facebook pages. I don't know if you remember, but there used to be like a square picture in the corner and then like six preview pictures of the last most common like pictures that you posted on the top um, of the profile pages before they redesigned it. But it has all of those old assets that created these like banners on it. So that one was called Upper Shelf Book Rentals, made some money on that side. And then one of them that I did with a student organization on campus was with a company that was going head to head with Chegg. And we re renegotiated that the affiliate is tied to the customer for their entire duration of that, like for the entire LTV, basically, rather than just the sign up one time. And so I, I linked it up with the fraternity. And what we did with that is during rush. So during, during the first week of school or two weeks of school, everyone's going out trying to recruit for the fraternity. But what we did was we parried that on top of those rush cards. And so the rule was, if it's a guy, go talk to him, see if he's interested. If it's a girl that walks by, hand her the affiliate code. And that's it. You get to, it, like, it was an icebreaker to meet girls. But at the same time, it was, you know, you're, you're doing what you needed to do for the recruitment side. Year one, the first semester, it made us $200. Everyone was like, we could do so many other things that make us more money. Over the next year that made over $25,000 in affiliates, which for a student organization on campus, that's some serious coin. <laughs> so yeah, I did that as a side hustle. And then I don't know if, should I dive more into like internships or like getting into startups or, or where do you kind of want to well, see? Uh, if QME was one of those, I mean, projects, which I know you spent a couple of years on, you can dive into that or we can kind of come back to it later on. Wherever you guys want to go, I'm totally comfortable with it. Did you want to talk about QME or? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a huge piece of, of a yeah. lot of stuff. I think, well, because you started off with your freshman and sophomore year, right? So I yeah. think when I met you, you were what, on the junior or senior? Junior year was, okay. was QME. Yeah. So there was a campus that. hackathon. So at the time, this is when like NFC tags were kind of having a little bit of a hype cycle. Uh, nowhere like they are today, right? Like this was still super early tech. Everyone thought it was weird tapping your phone against a device. And the company wanted to see basically how creative could you be with using NFC. NFC's, like stickers and like, you know, coffee mug or coffee coasters and stuff like that. I still think I have a couple of them. I used them in my car a couple of times. <laughs> yeah, it's super helpful technology, right? Yeah. But at, at the time it was just so early. No one knew what to do with them yet. A lot of like automation before automation was uh, like enabled for a lot of people. Absolutely. The so I wanted to I wanted to be involved with that hackathon, but I needed a team. So at the time I was a resident advisor, and one of the residents I knew was really into coding, and I was like, "Hey, you want to do this cool thing?" Uh, he's like, "Sure, I'll try it." So that was Kevin. The one of the other buddies was someone that I had been on the same floor my freshman year. So that was Eric. So now we had two coders and then we had two other individuals that were part of the fraternity that ended up joining. So one was like a graphic design person. The other person was a little bit more on the business side. So we had our team of five. We competed. I think we got like, like runner up or something like that. But then that's when we met Seth, right? You yeah. ran in Mecca, sat both the winning team down and our team down. And you guys are like, you guys can actually do something. <laughs> we didn't like the idea for what we did with the hackathon. We didn't think it was viable. But the idea that we did have was the ability to pre-order food on your mobile device. 
on campus. On campus. Yep. The only other thing at the time was Order Ahead, which was a YC company. They had just graduated from their batch. But outside that, there really was no competition for pre-ordering food. On campus, there was another one called T T Tap and Go or Tapingo, mm. which was locking down the campus's kind of approach. But again, Uber was not in the game. DoorDash didn't come out yet. Like all of this stuff was super early. The thesis was college campuses get a rush of business during passing periods. So there's a lull of business basically when everyone's in class, which is lost revenue and opportunity, right? So what we would do is you can then pre-purchase the food, which allows them to pre-order and start those things and basically collect revenue on the shoulder times that they normally would not. That was the initial thesis of it. We ended up joining Spartups, which Seth First, and... Yeah. Yeah. First batch. <laughs> we were and, very much still experimental and like just as hot headed and maybe, you know, letting our ego run us, but it was a fun time. <laughs> yeah. Have you had a chance to dive into like the, yeah, yeah. the thesis of Spartups? Not really into the thesis of Spartups, but it, it just like kind of morphed, right? As a meetup group that I was trying to organize and then Rand and Mecca joined and we were like, hey, we can turn this into an accelerator, which is all the rage. We were more like an incubator, which didn't really give any money. But, you know, it, our advantage was we had free real estate that we then leveraged with these guys into 2% warrants that, hey, don't pay us rent for a year or two years and let us support you as a portfolio company. But we didn't know what, what we were doing. So yeah, uh, they okay. were, None of us did. These guys put their faith in us just as much as we put it in them. So I'm super grateful. <laughs> Yeah. And it, it was a great experience, right? We met a ton of people that you guys introduced us to. I think the, the largest value was it was a group of individuals that were all trying to go on the same journey and they could collaborate together, which is something that would have not been available at San Jose State at the time to that degree. And I think that's the biggest value piece, just being around like-minded individuals. So let's see, QME itself. So we started doing that. We started building it. We spent two years on that. We were, we had an LOI with San Jose State University to pilot us. And after building it for around a year, it came around to the summertime. Now, a little bit of background on most of the team. We're all first gens. We're all, you know, hustling for our own money. We all landed pretty solid internships that summer. Actually, even now, if you kind of extrapolate out where everyone is today, yeah, it's it's kind of like the PayPal mafia story where everyone's done some awesome stuff. Yeah, but but like the the hard part of that was now we had to go tell our parents like, hey, we're thinking about pursuing this startup idea thing, or, you know, going somewhere that's paying thirty to forty dollars an hour for an internship, and. Like, I think right now that's still pretty good. But back then that was like phenomenal, right? And so like, like we were in these weird situations where like, okay, I think we have to go the internship route because there's too much unknown in the other route. And for the most part, like a lot of our parents put a lot into us of like getting to college. Like this is, this is the path that, that you, you're supposed to be taking. And eventually we ended up shutting down the company. So it was one of those things where I, we were definitely early, right? Uh, the tr like trend spotting was there. And, uh, you know, there, there's two big things that I think I took out of that, that experience. One of them during the process, I would say, is like perspective value. And so what I mean by that is going out into the market, you have to show value to the people that are, are basically going to accept the orders and those that have to take the orders. And going through that process was the first time that, so our like carrot was for students, you get a free drink if you sign up with us on your first order, right? To a student, a drink is like great. It's a couple of dollars, but the actual cost to any company for a soda is like 12 cents, right? So it's a little bit of price arbitrage that you can figure out how to get customers, which is what one individual cares about. And then something in, in return. And at the time, these other companies are like $10 every sign up, things like that. I'm like, we're not funded. We can't do that. Um, but it was also very much so a double-sided marketplace before there were other examples, like where you could, you know, today maybe find some blueprints or, or some, you know, some people who have put content around it back then, 
double sided like a single marketplace was tough enough doing a double sided marketplace as students was super impressive yeah and then the the second win the second lesson i took out of that one small wins keep the team motivated i think when you're building a company the real rewards usually pretty far away and it's a little bit of a grind to get there right and so Working in ways or those like mini milestones, I think is super important when working with a team to keep them motivated, kind of keep it. It allows them to basically kind of see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel. And, you know, maybe there's a crack that comes in through the tunnel here or there to light it up a little bit more. But those two things are definitely things I've taken into like future ventures of like one thinking about your positioning marketplace, how like perceive value changes based on the audience. And then the second piece is the actual team itself that's working on it is how to keep them motivated with those small baby wins along the way. That's the first time we've heard that stuff. I'm not saying in general, like I get it, but like, and I think it's, you know, it's, it's apropos and universal, but Nick, that's the first time. And we've probably done eight, 10 episodes. Any founder has been like, Hey, micro wins are good. Micro wins are micro wins. And and you were the first one to be honest, talking about morale of your team. And not only that, I think right now we're we're really getting into a, a kind of unique perspective that many people don't, which is, you know, for Nick and his team to have attempted a startup back when it wasn't cool, and you know, even even going through the rounds of putting two two years of your prime time really into something where you're spending money, you're putting a lot of effort. And you have a team that's small, super smart and has all these other opportunities to go through that. And then like, I'm, I'm excited to learn about what happened next because compared to today, the lens, it, you're, you're going to see like a, a massive jump, I guess. Yeah, the, the amount of, like you were saying, the, the content that's available today is... 10x 100x more than what was available back then and even podcasts like this it's super helpful to be able to have a resource to listen to and kind of take take a little bit of like nuggets of like oh okay maybe i should try this or oh maybe i should try that and i think a lot of the advice or shared stories that comes from these types of podcasts they're very situation based especially when you start to see in some of the comments where they're like there was a podcast I was listening to the other day and they were talking about the value of naming the projects something. So in Slack, it'll be like, oh, project, I don't know, Pegasus is over here doing this and this other project's doing something. And the comments were super mixed. Some of them are like, oh, I hate having to remember all these code names. I hate like doing all this stuff. It makes it all seem bigger than what it is. But then if you take a step back and think about it, if you're a startup versus comparing that same kind of routine to a company that's a little bit more mature, right? And is cash flow heavy and everything like that, like it's going to be received differently, right? At every company that I've had been a part of, we do code names. Absolutely, we do code names because I think there's three things that you get out of even just having a code name. One, Coming up with a name when you do name it creates a sense of ownership, right? And it allows someone to be like, it's not just a task, it's less transactional. It's like, there's something tied to it now. Two, when you're going through the process of actually like building out that piece, it's like it's like you're building. So like, like right now we have a project that's called Project Boomerang, right? And as Project Boomerang kind of comes to maturity, you can kind of, see these like pieces to it and that name's always going to be like now tied to the success of that project so that six months from now you'd be like hey do you remember when we did boomerang versus hey do you remember that one time we had did that one project where we had to talk about those one users at that one use case and you're like i don't know what you're talking about at this point right so there's that piece and then the third kind of piece when naming projects i think it works really really well for like Tasks that can have a defined start and end date. And it works not as well when there's like an ongoing task with it. So it's like, if you got to re- pull reports every every Monday and compile them and stuff like that, don't give them a name. Like if anything, that's just going to 
you're like project pull my reports every week is horrible right like like <laughs> don't use it in those those cases but i think this there's value to 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 those things Seth, were we do we just have one where they were talking about you know give your guys teams like give them names like that's an ownership of belonging and empowerment like and it makes so much sense to me it makes so much sense to me yeah i was spinning up a new team at at the current startup that i'm at and day one after we like you know you have the the formal like meetings with everybody so that everyone knows like who's reporting to who things like that i created a separate dm with with the team i was like all right step one what are we going to name ourselves right and i was like i I have no preference, but we should have a name with it. We chose like Team Ninjas or something like that, right? And because we kind of see ourselves as like the the Black Ops team of, of no, the team ops group. Super Awesome was taken. Don't bullshit me, Nick. <laughs> team, we we slay faces was was already taken. You're like shit. I guess we're team. Well, we wanted a, an emoji that also complimented it, right? You haven't seen the slay face emoji? Come on, Nick. You, you really? <laughs> it's fair. That's that's super fair. <laughs> but. Yeah, it, it, it's cool because seeing on the team now, like, hey, ninjas, and then they keep going with it, right? Or they're, you're right, there's a, a subset of community that could be built within the team of what they're actually doing. Yeah, I mean, it's it's better than people turning or turning into their own kind of private cliques, right? Um, it, it, it's a somewhat of a similar uh, feeling that you're instilling, but more inclusive and towards the same goal, so. I, that that's that awesome perspective. I don't think we've actually heard that before yet uh, so far, but a really good nugget. Absolutely. I um, think we were, so uh, I, I'm interested to know, like, let's continue the rest of your story, like after QME, because we're going to get a lot more nuggets, I think, in the third part. And where are we at in Nick's like time frame here? Yeah. We graduated. We're I haven't even graduated yet. Like, okay, I feel like you <laughs> haven't even graduated yet. We've written an Amy biography. You're like, uh huh. And I became president of the moon. And then I started uh, walking. So, you know, that's kind of how it went. Still in diapers, still in diapers, but we're good. In in college, I was I was super, super involved. And so okay. I think there was so much to pull from it. Like I was the student body president, I was president of my fraternity, like all of the positional stuff that I could basically get, I got my hands on. And there's tons of things that I pulled from each of those experiences. But after graduating, I decided to go uh, consult with Deloitte for a couple of years. I thought it would be, one, I get to see how a corporate piece works, right? So like kind of tried the startup thing with CUME, but I was like, okay, let's go see how a big corporation works. What are best practices that I can learn from them? that eventually I could take with me and add to my tool set. So one of the big things that they're they're really, really big on is the apprenticeship model. And that's kind of how they train everyone as they're coming in into the fold. And I learned a lot about how like repetition breeds excellence. And if you could accelerate that repetition, that you, you just get more reps in, right? It's like when you you go to the gym or anything like that, the more reps that you get in, the more you're going to become an expert in it. And so I, I learned that piece there with the way that we worked with so many different clients in, you know, a niche of different types of way that we consult, can consult. But because you get to see it in different industries, different different life, like areas of where that life cycle is on, on that issue, really starts to kind of sharpen the, the blade's edge a little bit on that side. And then one of the biggest takeaways that I got from that entire experience is really around the aspect of working with a global team. And so I was working with people from Australia, Europe, India, right? Two big takeaways. One, time zones, which works best for everybody. The second is communication, because there's only so much that you can really get across like, like you have to, you have to strip away any kind of assumption when you're writing information to others across the globe for two reasons. One, if you're not clear, you burn a day because when they come back with the question, it's already the next day. So it can become super inefficient if you're not a good communicator. The second part is like cultural norms, right? So when you're like detailing something out, it has to be super, super thorough where you're putting your steps together. Sometimes you might want to have a supplement video that supports it, right? But that skill set has helped me at 
multiple startups afterwards when I'm working with teams offshore. It's helped me work with teams, like speeding up my own teams with different work and projects. It's just like, how can I put something together, put my time and investment in for like 20 or 30 minutes? And I never have to touch that process again, right? Like that, that's a way easier way to go about any kind of process versus like, okay, put 30 minutes on my time, you know, every single week for the next three weeks, and then we'll train you up. You'll get used to it. Like I, you get more touch points, but if you could put something together, communicate, the, the reference is there, the communication is done. We're on to the next thing. After I left Deloitte, I joined Konica Minolta's Business Innovation Center. It's a, so a lot of these large companies that have innovation centers, which are basically like their entrepreneurs in residence. Super, super hard thesis. They're like, hey, we're a legacy dying printer company. Innovate us. It was difficult <laughs> to, say, to say the least. But, you know, it, it, was, it was an experience nonetheless, right? Like you're kind of in this new area. You're learning how to be political a little bit, but also be innovative. They can only move so fast. Left that company, then started... Then I saw a YouTube that talked about WeChat and how it's the everything app in China. So now we're looking at it at like 2017, 2018 timeframe. And I was like, wow, this is cool. I mean, now Elon's talking about it with X.AI and all this other stuff that he's doing. But I was like, okay, cool. U.S. should be able to do this. And I was like, all right, well, why doesn't it work in the U.S.? And, you know, in China, it's kind of a, you know, they got their, their great firewall. So it's kind of a closed ecosystem versus in the US, it's an open ecosystem. So that, that plays a role in it. Um, at the time, WeChat was kind of like how WhatsApp grew into becoming the main messaging platform. So they kind of like built it off of that. I think Gojek is another good company out of like Southeast Asia, Indonesia area that did a very similar model. And so I was like, me and one of my buddies were going down like, okay, what would be our like, that, that sliver to get into the market to then grow something bigger out of. We came to the conclusion that it's going to be our contact list. And so what it would do is you would, it would connect with your normal contact list. It'd pull your contacts in, but then you can add any and all of your social contacts with it and then be able to share it based off a customized like card inside the, the app. So if you go to a bar and you only want to share your Snapchat and Instagram, that's the only thing that would be triggered when you share it through our app. So it was called Connected. And we were like, okay, the virality would be individuals that meet. So we targeted college kids again because the first semester, everyone's trading contacts, right? So we're going to reduce that friction point around which social you want to share, how do you do it, one touch click when you're signing into like student organizations, things like that. So like... The, the, the network event would be really around trading contacts. And then, and then we would build from there. That one lasted maybe six or eight months. We had a working MVP. There was a couple of student organizations on campus that was using it to move things back and forth. But really what we, we were competing against was native contacts inside of the phone. <laughs> and, and eventually that kind of fell off. Another version that we saw later down the line was people tie that with like an NFC card and then or you can just QR tap it. Or... Yeah. Or a QR code. Uh, we, we actually use QR codes as, as the primary sharing piece of it, but it was like NFC tap that they were using to, to transfer it. So m missed the boat on that one again, but that, that, that was another at bat that we had with. with what was the, what was the business model on it, Nick? Yeah. So the idea was if it was going to be super, so if it, if it could catch virality through people just connecting back and forth, you'll kind of be able to leverage the fact that as people mature through college, they'll also expand them up, right? So like if they all come in as freshman year, they get used to it. By the time their senior year comes in four, you know, four years from now, then it's a little bit more of a mature product throughout that ecosystem. So we were going to target different colleges in the same way of just basically going for micro ecosystems first. Then we'll start to bolt on other services to it. Never got to the other bolt on services, right? But those are the services that then would be where the revenue lied versus money out of the gate. Thing. User acquisition was needed first. Yeah. Well, actually, so because so in Pakistan at the time, 2016 to 2020, 
because of Pakistan's relationships with China, right? So we were also super, uh, very exposed to the the Everything app and WeChat very early on. Actually, WeChat invested in some of some companies in Pakistan early stage startups. So a big reason why the U.S. can't really have an Everything app sort of thing is because of you know, regulations around it over here. People would throw a fit, calling it a monopoly, etc. Pakistan, we didn't have that problem. So we actually invested in a couple who were trying it. They were, let's just say, like, you know, we threw out the book in terms of where people tell, say it with entrepreneurs, like only focus on one thing at a time. Whereas we were like, hey, try whatever you want. Um, some of those companies are still working. So like uh, a lot of bigger ones now, Uber, Kareem over there is actually like touting itself as the everything app because they've enabled like laundry service and, um, you know, anything basically logistics related for themselves. And they've also implemented Kareem Pay, which is going to be their local bank. So the three, it was logistics, payments, and e-commerce. Those three things were what we ended up simplifying as the beginning of an everything app before you could tackle on more. Did they build those three out prior to launching or did they choose no, no, no. one first? They, so Kareem started off with just competing against Uber, so doing car rides. But then through the Kareem app itself, they started introducing, so through Kareem credits, which is what uh, Starbucks is right now doing with their cards, right, is how they started allowing like users like me to just put, let's say, 5,000 rupees, 10,000 rupees into the app or give the driver that cash. He would add credit and any other ride, I wouldn't really have to take cash out unless I had that. Credit. Interesting. And eventually by allowing me to time my debit card, or credit card, and then add credit, like they use that to then in Pakistan, get what was called an uh, electro electronic mobile license, I believe. And then like that. So the, the managing director of Kareem in Pakistan is the head of Kareem pay. And they were working on that because uh, we had invested in some fintech startups that they were also kind of talking to about working on Kareem Pay before they launched it as a separate brand. So, but yeah, that entire process, even today, like people who are touting the everything app outside of China, they only have maybe two of those three elements in there. So, so like the, the fact that you guys tried and then I, I'm pretty sure like with GDPR and then, you know, like privacy laws and stuff. That probably also influence your decision afterwards. But again, thinking of thinking big and and having friends who could help you with that, like I think that's that's pretty awesome that you you guys attempted it here. Yeah, I think I think Gojek is the only one to do it outside of outside of China pretty well. They've, I think it's Gojek or is it Grab? Can no, be I'm Grab. Pretty sure it's Gojek, or I think Gojek and Grab are related somehow. Yeah, it it's it's hard to. You're right. There's forty five percent of the market over there. Gojek is running. Grab has fifty five percent of it. But yeah, one of them has definitely like branched out in, into all the other verticals after that point. So I'm tr I've actually never used WeChat. I truly thought it was just a chat function. So in over here it is, but yeah, if you it's go just to a China, chat function. We had so Alibaba. Alibaba owns WeChat, right? Or Ant really? Financial owns Alibaba. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and so oh, Ant yeah, Financial does, but... uh, invested in so my my old co-founder in Pakistan. His his fintech, and then they also in they had an accelerator program themselves where they invited. So in the e-commerce, logistics, and fintech space. Some of our, our funds entrepreneurs also ended up going where they got a two-week paid stay and tour of all of Ant Financials, like e-commerce, logistics, and fintech founders. And yeah, they, like, they were investing a lot into, I'm, I'm pretty sure like other Asian countries as well, but that was a, a pretty amazing to hear. Hey Raj, so if you're, if you're checking out WeChat on the US version, to get to the, let's say the other side, you change it in the language settings to Chinese. Really? And it, it unlocks the other side. I had an Opus phone, which is a random Chinese phone, and the WeChat was full. Oh, because it was already probably default into the So like is Chinese that embedded? Settings. Like, yeah, is, it, is that like one of their native softwares? Maybe. <laughs> yeah, no, it seems... So 
Yeah, in China, like from my again limited knowledge, but in that proximity and from Pakistan, it's so interesting. It is consider like a day, like you don't have to all your social media, all your finances, all your payments, bills, everything is controlled to the state. It it actually reminds me of the new Bing, and I downloaded Bing after I heard OpenAI was gonna be integrated with it, and Bing today is the closest version to that WeChat that I've found so far in Pakistan or outside of Pakistan. Just the Bing um, app itself? The Bing app itself. Like so they they have it split up into different apps within Bing. So like they have games and like weather and XYZ. But then eventually I believe they're gonna have like bank stuff and they're so through AI because if you're using their you know live or hotmail uh, mailbox, open AI or, or that AI is going to be able to then organize your bills, your current travel, just kind of like what Gmail does. And that I see kind of turning into like the closest version of the everything app so far, but there could be others. It's like, I can't like wrap my, like, like banking. I have a PCI compliance. I have a tokenization. Like it just, it seems interesting. Again, because of our rules and regulations, no, that yeah, 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 yeah. To do here, but in China, under the the one party and you know the one API, let's call it, uh, they it's can, like that's like it's literally like we don't have to scrape anything. There's one API, but then from done. a privacy standpoint, now shut up. <laughs> no privacy is also. I mean, in China, that's there's why no such thing. Is, you know, yeah, you know, your freedoms are kind of different. It's just um, interesting. It, it's very similar to how people can build on Facebook. Like think Farmville built on the Facebook platform. So with WeChat, you could build into the WeChat platform yeah. itself. Okay. So instead okay. of having a web browser, that's your access to the online world, you would have I one gotcha. app that accesses all apps. I got you. I got you. I got you. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, that's awesome. So what, what happened after Connected? Let's see. That we shut down after a little bit of time. And then, so during that time, I was taking a break. So I wasn't working full-time at that, that, at that moment. And so when we shut that down, then I was like, all right, time to start going back into startups again. So then I had joined an early stage workforce management software uh, called Legion Technologies. So it's the software that helps basically organize your hourly employees. And if you, if you think about like, if I'm not too sure if you guys have worked retail, but a lot of the times it's the manager the week prior that has a piece of paper mapping out, mm, I need two people this day and maybe one person this day. Um, kind of a, an archaic system there. So we brought machine learning into the process where we could use historical past data, both across your own company or the industry itself and predict the amount of individuals that you might need. And it pulls in things too. So like, let's say if you're at an airport, we could pull in the airport schedule. So we also know when peak time of more planes will be coming in that specific day in that specific terminal so that you can then staff appropriately. Sporting events, same thing, right? Like a Chick-fil-A that's right next to a sporting event is going to be very different than the days that's not on sporting events. Oh, so okay. using that kind of approach for, for the market on that side, and a big driver of that is, is compliance. So, so if you kind of alluded to it, right? Like we have all this compliance everywhere. Um, so one of the big, the big pieces being pushed forward on that part is, so like back when I worked at Oakley, back when I was in, in high school, you could start your shift and maybe if it's a slow day, the manager comes up and it's like, you could go home, right? Or sometimes you'll get a call earlier that day and they're like, Hey, we actually don't need you today. Well, that. It, I mean, in high school, I'm like, great, cool. I'm going to go hang with my friends. But if I was actually doing that as a full-time gig, like that messes up the amount of money I'm going to make that day, right? So at least at the time when I was still back at Legion, I I'm, I can only assume it's continued to expand, but New York, San Francisco, Emeryville, a lot of the big metropolitan cities, they started passing laws that protected hourly workers for schedule predictability. And so a lot of these companies were starting to see fines come in through the cities that they needed to help manage with um, their compliance. And so that was the other angle that Legion was helping with was, hey, you'll be more accurate with your schedules, which prevents fines, compliance issues, and things like that. And yeah, kind of kind of snowballs from, from there. 
So I was there, helped build out their customer success team, a lot of their processes there on that side, which which for me was like the first time being outside of consulting and having to be on like kind of a sales division of walking into enterprise businesses and be like, all right, cool. This is how we're going to implement you in the next six months. So trying to get trying to get those things up. And I remember at the time, I think it was like three months to get them stood up, but the goal was to get them down to something like four weeks or something like that. And so also working on the processes of like, how do you basically create this? Because a lot of the technology on that stack is like super, super old. And so like, can we create basically a plug and play SaaS tool that touches your payroll, your time off modules, your check in, check out, like all of that stuff has to integrate in a really quick way so that you can just spin it up, use this new tech and kind of spin out, you know, get, get, get up and on your way. So I did that for a little bit was there for a year, then 2020 hit. And during 2020, I was like, look, I need to kind of focus on myself. So quit my job in the middle of 2020, I had nothing lined up and started doing some freelance consulting for startups. The focus piece really was helping startups organize and get things going kind of from that like zero to one piece. And so like by zero to one, I mean, like literally someone has an idea, I'll work with them to develop, systematize, like here's the value of an MVP. Like, this is how you get your POC done. This is, you know, you don't need to build everything. You want to test it with customers, right? Like a lot of that, like really intro levels, level of like, how do you get something off the ground to validate that you actually have a good idea versus just like, I have this grand idea that may not work. How to figure Um, out which experiments to run in the first place. That's also a superpower. Yep. And, And how to do it in a scrappy way, right? Like a lot of these people that I was talking with, they were kind of strapped on cash and you're like, okay, yeah, you can do this one route that's going to cost you a couple thousand dollars or you throw together an air table that talks to a Google form with a Zapier call and you can do the same thing, right? So just kind of being more uh, creative with, with the approach as well. Towards the end of 2020, Twitter started buzzing with this thing called Clubhouse. And I was like, wow, they're growing. Sent a cold email. I was like, hey, I can only assume this, this, and this is broken. I can help you with that. <laughs> so I consulted with them for a couple of months, specifically helping them build out everything from, so I was doing contract management, vendor management, trust and safety, customer support, some policy operations. And, and this is a lot of the stuff that's like, like you're thinking trust and safety, that stuff is always in the news for social, right? Then you got like customer support. It's like, well, how does, how do people fix things at scale? when the old model was send something into support at and someone manually is going to help you, right? Like they went from this small test flight app that hit virality on Twitter to, you know, millions of users in a very, very short amount of time. So there was a lot of things breaking that we were, you know, focused on just standing up a process of some sort to to help optimize that. And then after after doing consulting there for a little bit, then I ended up actually joining the the team, and and you know went went on a ride for for that for a while. And and you're you're underselling it, but I'm pretty sure that ride was crazy. <laughs> yeah, the there was like so many things that were on fire right at the same time, and there was a ton of takeaways that I had right, like things I would how I would approach certain things in a certain way and how it differs based off of the different externalities that are coming at you at that time. You really have to focus on the 80, 20, right. Or the 20, 80, right. Like you can't, can't be striving to have a perfect solution on anything. Really. There's, there's just not enough time. And looking back so like getting virality, I think is like the one thing that like a lot of startup founders, like even when I was starting my, my startup, I was like, look, we're going to do this. We're going to overnight have success and, you know, be, be billionaires. I don't think any startup actually wants that. Like, I think they want that in theory, but like, so, like yeah, it's got to be slow over a, no- a number of years. And that allows you to build the processes and provide that level of service that you want to actually provide to an individual because like, you know, like here, here's a great example at clubhouse. Everyone was like, Hey, the app keeps crashing. Well, 
yeah, we have three engineers that didn't build a stack for a million people. They're not pushing new features because they're trying to keep the lights on, right? Like it, it, it is those kind of things that you have to like think at from a tech stack level of you got to give and take something. And like, if the community is misaligned with that now it creates misaligned expectations, which is actually more detrimental than if you were to just grow it steadily and they see things happening, it's having good uptime, right? Like you you always want to be meeting your customer or exceeding your customer's expectations. And so getting on the flip side of that can be really, really harmful down downstream. And then I think like the the other part is just have ruthless focus. Like it's so easy to see shiny objects or be worried about things like, like, like you were talking about, like CCPA, GDPR, like all of that kind of stuff. Super, super important, super, super regulated when it comes to like social media companies. But you also have to keep trades of like, what do you have the right to earn to work on versus things that you like should do, right? And so doing some compliance is important, but if you don't even have a company that's able to stand up on itself, what's the point of even going through a SOC 2 compliance audit and doing all of that time, energy, like money, costs, headcount, right? Like all of that stuff goes into it. Like it, the, the trade-offs just don't make sense, right? And so being able to build a priority list of things and looking at it with that lens, like something's always going to have to give. It's not the most ideal, but at, you have a constraint, which is usually human capital. And so th those are things that are going to gonna have to be things that you give up, at least in the short term, right? Until you can kind of earn the right to then double down on that side. And how you, you were at Clubhouse for how long? I think it was like a year and a half. Oh, you were there for a while. Yeah. Yeah, during that, that rise. Because this entire tenure was probably two years. Yeah, so it that was... I, that, I, that the lay folk user heard and, and was, you know, we were I was probably right in the, the middle of the bell curve, of the barbell, to be honest. Yeah, d during the spike and everything. So like when I joined, I think it was like less than 20 people. When I left, it was over a little bit over 100. Yeah, and which... they raised, you guys raised and everything? Yep. Series C, I think, is what I ended up going through. No, and, and even a lot of that perspective, right? Like being part of the team and seeing all the, a lot of the fires and, and still being in a small enough team to where you have access to a lot of that information and to seeing what's going on. Like, I, I, I'm sure it was very taxing as well, just as much as it was exciting. Yeah, it was long weekends, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and, and a lot of people don't, like seem to forget that with success, you end up having to work a lot harder. And it, it's not just the, the slow and easy and the manageable increments, uh, which always happen in your favor. So, Yeah, and it, like, it, it kind of alludes back to like earlier, right? When you're in the grind like that, working seven days a week, you have to find ways to motivate the team, right? And so it's like, well, what's the perspective of like why we're doing this and then also like really just like i think with like everyone going remote also there's kind of like three buckets i think if you look at the way that like work has changed since 2020 you have the in-person situation everyone comes to the office you get updates from kind of like the team through osmosis of just being physically with each other there's the hybrid piece where those that are in person are going to benefit from that osmosis piece. And then that's where you start to see those that are in the remote side. They're kind of either forced to send something in an async Slack message, or you're being an inconvenience by throwing time on someone's calendar, right? Because like they're, they're going to be focused on something. So already just having that build out of any kind of company, those who are remote, there's going to be a slow the, their opportunity is going to be a little bit less than those that are going to be able to take benefit of going in person. Then you have full remote where everyone's kind of on the same page, sending async things. But I do think that at least from like maybe a career perspective, it's going to be slower across the board for anyone that's working in that, in that environment, right? Because if you don't tell the manager in that, that weekly update, 
or you don't even have the ability to meet with them for 15 minutes every week, there's definitely going to be a slow there's, there's going to be a delay in the time that which information is going to be passed from like those two individuals with everything. So I, I kind of saw that over the time, right? Clubhouse born in 2020, everyone was remote. By the time I left, we had an office in San Francisco. People were flying in once a week, but you could start to see those that were like based in San Francisco. They, 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 they were just more in sync, right? Because they're seeing each other every day. They're probably talking on the side when they're having lunch maybe they're getting some drinks after work, right? And it's not just unique to, to Clubhouse. I think that that's across the entire industry of really looking at how businesses have evolved coming out of out of COVID. And I, I think that there is a, obviously a case to be made for people to get back into the office, but there's just as much of a case for people who want to stay remote. So it'll be interesting to see how things play out there. Absolutely. Where, like, so after Clubhouse, where where are you at, at yourself now? Because you've gone the corporate route, you've tried startups yourself, you've been a part of a rocket ship, and you know, like, uh, I'm sure psyche wise, and and you know, after working probably harder than you've had to in the past with Clubhouse and you uh, uh, than other projects, like, what where you had in your head. So when I was thinking about leaving Clubhouse, I was all intention. I was like, I'm going to go find some big company and just be a number and kind of hide for a little bit. Like I need- Every entrepreneur goes through that. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a little bit of rest and rest. Let best, me breathe for you know? three years. Yeah, let me just breathe for three years. <laughs> and so I was, I was interviewing at all the, the big firms, you know, trying to just find where would be a good fit, things like that. Then I got a cold DM from- the current CEO of the company that I'm at now. And he told me the story of everything. And so what, what, what we do is at, at its core, we're a Medicare insurance broker. But the issue that we see in the industry is a lot of individuals, because of the way that insurance is designed historically, they're selling what's best for them, not what's best for their clients. So there's a misalignment in incentives. What? No. Wild. <laughs> you just Wild. said that what? publicly. <laughs> <laughs> They're going to come for you, Nick. <laughs> hey, let them come because it's not like I'm hiding anything that's not true, right? And so you I had just- the fucked up part is? Sorry, but like we have the, com- the conversation ends at that. Yeah, we just, all know. We all know. <laughs> okay. Thank you, question mark. Oh my goodness. There's a number of industries that are like this, right? Real estate. Yeah like insurance, like there's, there's a number of them where you look at these individuals as the expert professionals that their best interest is literally themselves unless their own ethical compass is really, really like refined. And so I had just gone through a headache of things with my grandfather and my dad, all this stuff all around Medicare. And so I had just become super familiar with like, this stuff is broken. And I was like, oh man, do I want to jump back into a series A startup? Because I know what that's going to entail. Or do I want to go the other route and kind of like chill, chill for a little bit. But then when I was thinking about it, I was like, if I was at like one of the big tech companies, I would not give a crap about the work I'm doing, like at all. I'll wake up every day, clock in, clock out, push whatever small project that I need to do. At that point, they might name it something fancy and I won't care. And it'd be very, very unfulfilling. This one was, I think finally something that like, I could actually stand behind the mission of like what it is. And I was like, you know, I, I can literally see it make a difference in each and every person that, I mean, like the, the instant upsize, it it helps my own family members. So like there's a huge win there, but also because of like, we're constantly having like client interviews and stuff like this. I get to talk to our clients every single day and it's great. You get to like literally hear about like what they're going through and how this community has been basically preyed upon for so many years. And so making a difference there is really why I I came to, to fair square and, you know, working towards how, how we can go against these big guys that have, position themselves 
over the years and kind of gave gave the industry a bad bad rap. So trying trying to lead the charge on that change. And tell, tell us a little more about the company. Like when you when you first joined, what did you joined like pre Series A or at Series A or Series A had just been announced. So they were using some of that new cash to hire on and expand the teams. I think within three months of me being there, basically we were able to double the business, brought on a bunch of team members. The team is super, super lean. Everyone's really, really focused. One like, like Sorry, that's of- wild. I I like cool. I'm pre-seed, pre-revenue ideation. So going from zero dollars to two dollars, yeah, I, I doubled my revenue. You said post series A, yep. three months, then doubled. Yeah. So I think people should really just let that one sink in. <laughs> Again, it's not penny gap zero to one. It's like, bitch, we are series, like we have a series A and I double that shit. Yeah. And and like obviously before I joined, right? I'm vetting the founding team and the operating team as much as they're vetting me. And so some of the things that really stood out to me was the founder had done another startup before. So this, you know, one of the questions I had during our interview is like, what were your learnings that you took from that? Because like, if, if there were none, that that's a red flag. And, you know, how is that going to affect the way that you want to steer this company? He had also just went through the YC program. He, so he's a solo founder, technical and, you know, on the business side of things. And then a lot of the team members also, I think like the one common thread across everyone on this team is everyone has started a company prior. And so a lot of our discussions are like, well, we tried this at this one thing at this <laughs> one time. And it, it, it's a very different level of experience to bring to a team than like, hey, when I was at name big company and I was working on this very, very small niche project, we tried X and you're like, well, you know, you're kind of missing like 98% of the other side of like the, the problem. So things like that, just the team moves extremely fast. And yeah, like, I don't know, insurance is, is, is interesting. It's so regulated, but at the same time, there's like, I look at Lemonade and what they did to the like renter's insurance space. And I think it's amazing. Metro Mile did some pretty good innovation on their side too. And so bringing that to the Medicare industry, I think it's, it's super interesting, right? 10,000 people are becoming, are turning 65 every day in the United States. So it's a substantial number of people considering that every single one of them needs Medicare insurance. Oh, Raj is actually working. I was, I, I was about to say, like, I'm with you, dude. <laughs> like, I'm, yeah, so mom, dad, sister, brother, all physicians. I went to medical school. I absolutely hate our our insurance system. Oh, he dropped out of medical school. By the way. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I dropped out. <laughs> I dropped out. But, like, it's exactly kind of what you guys are talking about and, and disrupt it. You look at people, you can vilify them as much as you want. I have no, I don't give a shit what people think. Elon Musk, like a lot of people don't understand that Tesla has its own insurance company. Mm-hmm. Tesla knows Nick, how fast you drive. Tesla knows Nick, you under the speed limit, you use your blinker, you don't get in wrecks. We're going to insure it a lower premium. We're doing that for our, our SaaS solution. Our health company is having preventative health and, and healthy habits as an adoption. And in five years, Nick, I'm telling you, we're going to be a health insurance company based yeah. on preventative healthy habits. So like, I, I I know for a fact, we'll be the Tesla model in the healthcare side because it's bullshit. It's bull. I mean, I studied my mom, my dad, my sister, and brother, the epitomes of health, or they're supposed to be. And you'd probably know what it is. Like our, our, medicine drawer turned into a medicine cabinet turned into a medicine room and i'm like enough guys enough you lazy bastards because you can't find you know x y and z to stick to a healthy habit so like i'm with you dude i'm with you and then the albatross around the neck people don't understand people don't get what they're because it's so far removed from their immediate nose you know there's no cash value of my social security is not there i don't need medicare medicaid i'm a gen i'm a whatever you don't think about it you don't think about the burden and and it's brutal i mean so like, that's why I'm like, I was actually Googling fair share. Like, it's really interesting that you, what you guys are doing. And and hopefully, listen, I'm sure I'm going to piss a lot of people off. So I know that's going to be, you know, the, the, there's big pharma lobbyists for a certain reason. So that's going to be a daunting heavy lift, but whatever, man. Yeah. I mean, it sounds like with the information you're collecting, right? You'll be able to underwrite 
in a way that's... that the, the traditional companies cannot. And that's going to be the, the big value driver. We're taking these data analytics on one to one, not even just movement pattern, but you know, efficacy of usage and also like re, like recidivism. So like, how often is Nick going on and off and on and off these these kind of like fad diets or whatever these healthy habits? Oh, he's got consistency. You know, now we've normalized the income, the, the volatility of the month over month of him sticking these these habits. We don't take HIPAA compliant stuff, but like your BMI and non HIPAA compliant stuff is something that is extremely and nobody does it on the one to one. So, you know, people are like, oh, so like Noom. I'm like, no, but like we do ours, stick it to the healthy habit, personality. So it's it's imagine the myers Brig for your wellness provider. Okay. And if you stick to that, the LTV is 270% higher. And now we know that you're healthier. So once we can confirm if sticking to a healthy habit through belonging and empowerment and relationship quotient, you're going to stay healthier and we're going to ensure it a little bit. Wow. Yeah, definitely after this podcast, we should link up <laughs> i'd love to we already have like optum health like because we're the first and this is what's interesting is we are literally the first platform that can take hsa and fsa monies and we just got covered under the silver sneakers program because oh, wow. that was my passion like i want that 16 digit code and i want to make sure my providers have 100 percent, you know uh, reimbursement rate and it's working so. yeah and and a big piece of it too is just being able to take that headache head on of going through all the compliance pieces, right? Like, like you were saying, there's HIPAA, there's what needs to qualify for HSA, what yeah. for FSA, how does that differ? What are the product types? It was know? brutal going through that compliance. Like, cause you, you know what it was like every single tranche has a step. And I think we were lucky. Seth was actually, st he was lockstep with me as like a, a basically go to market. We were looking at the tech stars longevity accelerators. Cause they're all leaning into, especially the one in Seattle, you know, Pivotal Ventures is backing it. They're like, Raj, like, this is it. This is it. This is it. Agritech, because it's what you're putting in your body. And then a pseudo insure tech, because everybody's going to need it. Yeah, absolutely. It, now, now it's just the race, right? To, to get it all done. Well, so that's the thing. And everyone's like, yo, you know, there's so much co competition in what you're doing. I'm like, nobody's doing what we're doing. They're looking at a very commoditized, like, hey, like certain ways of doing it. Like, you have to move towards a healthcare play in general. Everyone's like, well, like, okay. But it's it's huge. Like I didn't raise a Series A, so that's going to be a long slug. Yeah. So right now, are you just investing revenues back in, and that's what's churning everything in? We're lucky. We've been we've been doing well. We've been growing well. Not just, not lucky. Like you know, when when you hear Raj's story and we've and been working. Kind of the detail, yeah, we've been working hard. It's worked a lot out of really underground. Well. But this is what's interesting. I like, guess a non technical founder, like I don't have a burden of knowledge. Like okay, you have to do your SaaS or go to market this way. I'm like nobody's telling me anything. Oh, that worked. Okay, cool. Well, the, the, I, one of the big things too, right, is working in corporate conditions you to always ask for permission. Startups, you ask for forgiveness and, and you keep going, right? So I quit. Like I did what you did. I was like, I wanted my Deloitte experience. So I did 11 months at Goldman, quit. And the first thing I did was knuckle tattoos. I'm like, I'm never going to get hired again. Like that was it. So like I knew for a fact, like I'm just going to go stumble through and see what happens. So similar. When I, the month I quit Deloitte, I went and got my ears pierced. Cause like, you know, that's not that's the it. most kosher thing yeah, when you're, you're flying into like, let's say middle of small town, Texas. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's, that's a, let, let's switch modes a little more. So, you know, so Nick, you worked so as a founder and going through rocket ships and then now going through another, you know, potential rocket ship or well, com combination of a rocket ship with a mission that you're, you're very passionate about. Like how, what's it like, you know, I'm, I'm sure even as, as a founder myself and as somebody who's just interested to see like, what kind of work do you do with companies at that stage? Because it's still, you're, you're responsible for a lot of different things. You're wearing multiple hats. But you're part of the founding team who's kind of fitting in with other people. Like, I'd love to hear a little about not only your thought process when choosing a team, but then also like when do founders need someone like you, you know, on their side? Yeah. So I was, I don't know if you guys follow like the Hermosis on, on social. So Layla Hermosi, right. She's like the, the ops mind of, of the half when Alex is the marketing side. And she said something in one of her like talks that like really stuck out to me. There's basically two types of operators. You have your Swiss army knife and you have your scalpel. 
right? And when you're just starting a company, you're looking for more or less a lot of Swiss army knives, but eventually either those people need to graduate to become scalpels, or you need to find someone to replace them that is a scalpel that could then, you know, vertically really do well in that one specific niche. So I know what kind of knife I am. I'm a, I'm a Swiss army knife, right? And that's where my zone of genius is. And so when I'm going into these different companies, I don't, it, it doesn't matter what it is, right? It could be finance to I'm um, having calls with our legal teams to, it could be, you know, working to get HIPAA compliance or whatever it is. So when I'm working or looking at different companies, uh, I'm just more concerned about what is the largest bleed point in the company. And then that's where I'm going to go go for first right and nick i i gotta i'm gonna stop you there for a second but is it cool if we take a quick bio break yeah i'll let yeah, it go for part it out. Okay, we're back looks like so you were you were talking about like how being at uh, you're a swiss army knife and where along in the like startup journey you provide the most value yeah yeah so where that value really lies is like when there's chaos, I think a lot of times if there's a lot going on, it's kind of hard to take a step back and like objectively evaluate where things need to be done. Right. And so I think that's why even just between where I'm at today and during my time at clubhouse, I've done everything from trust and safety, legal policy operations, um, HIPAA compliance, recruiting, right? Like building out HR systems and rippling and all that kind of stuff, right? So like the the range is definitely there. And just, I think there's like two things that I really focus on. One, identify what that is. Two, standing up a process that's low maintenance. Because like, if you go in and you're like, well, like this big X company does it. You're like, yeah, they also have a team of 45 people that have to manage that every single day. Yeah. Right. And that, that's not realistic when you're just looking to put a, a lightweight process in that fills the gap, maybe fills the compliance piece, whatever that might be, so that you can then go focus on other things. Right. So what are really quick wins? Let's say you're running a commission based sales team every month or every week, you're going to have to like compile all of their commissions, right? Pulling from systems, calculating it all of that stuff. You can do it all manually where you're copying and pasting and things like that, or put the three hours in up front and you basically click a button and it says, you know, pay Seth X number of dollars, pay Raj X number of dollars, process it and rippling you're done, right? Like that value add there and the ability to take that like really slow slog process that might take two or three days and compile it down into just, you know, two hours maybe. That week over week, huge huge value it's kind of so it's it's very similar to what paula does for rod and, and for thrive just like he's a systems like kind of guru and, and process master so you need people like that early on on the team yeah and then as the company grows right they're on a scalpel and they're like okay now we can invest long term what this needs to look like a little bit more and then like because there's also, you know, many early stage founders, you know, people who, let's say, have tremendous experience, but aren't able to, you know, maybe they come through a similar uh, point in their career where they have to consider like joining another company, right, or, or joining a new team, like any, uh, like, uh, th this happened for me, actually, where you know, I, I was also thinking about like, do I stay seed series A or, you know, when you're interviewing for some later stage companies, it kind of turns into like, okay, we need a scalpel. Like, how can you help? And I'd love to get your perspective on like, as somebody who joined companies as a Swiss army knife, and then maybe been expected to focus on one particular aspect or, or narrow their field of vision, like any tips for people who are, who use, who aren't, sure enough about that process or like what it's like on the other side i think a little bit of self-awareness like i'm at a point in my career that i thrive being a swiss army knife and if they need a scalpel either i need to have been able to build the network within the company to find 
a new business line that they need to, to spin up and do that, or it's my time to leave. I think that that that's the biggest piece. Trying to, you know, what is that? Fit a square block in a round hole, right? Like you could try, <laughs> but I think people people usually fall into one of the two buckets unless like whatever piece that they're trying to evolve into being that scalpel for is something that they're truly, truly passionate about where they're not going to get shiny object syndrome looking at something else. And they're like truly, you know, loving HR or loving, you know, marketing to a point where they don't want to, you know, mess around with anywhere else. Then yeah. Like I, I don't see people like naturally getting to that point or you're just going to be fighting that resistance along the way. Makes sense. Is it usually a similar kind of tech stack that you're you're reapplying or that you've seen are being reapplied? Because there's there's this entire culture around like building processes and frameworks, right? Mm -hmm. But have you seen in many most cases those frameworks working better than having the experiment first kind of culture? Is the question more so around? like which product stack, like which, which like software is being used over and over again, or the methodology that's being applied? More of the methodology, but I, I'd be in, just as interested to see if you're also seeing the same tech stacks used over and over. I think the methodology has really broad strokes of similarities, but because the tech stack that lies underneath is changing so much, you have to be able to revise that equally as fast, mm -hmm. right? There's, I mean, think of the, the the ways you used to like use SQL, right? Like it was kind of a slog and you low key felt like a software developer, right? Now there's so many different services up there like Mode Analytics or Metabase or the, you know, their, their user interface is so much better. Their resources are so much better that like, okay, if you need to stand up something where, like I like a lot of the companies I've been at, they're pretty technical, where there's also this kind of belief that everyone should know how to do SQL in some way, shape, or form, right? Like we should all be a data-driven individual that makes decisions off of metrics. But part of that piece in order to become that individual is you need to be able to get the metrics. You need to be able to understand the metrics. You need to be able to calculate the metrics. And so a lot of these comp like a lot of the, the past startups I've seen is like one of the big pieces is like, how do you enable these people that typically cannot do this to do this in a lightweight way that doesn't feel like it's this like huge hurdle, right? Like I, at its core, I'm a non-technical dude, right? Like can't, I, I, I can maybe read some code. I think a lot of this is just over time, just seeing it so much, but if someone's like, hey, like write this SQL script from scratch, I'm just like, yikes, no, thank you. Like, I'm not gonna be able to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, well, how would I piece something together that makes it super lightweight, gets me the answer that I need, and it still looks like I made a dashboard, right? And and just creating those frameworks to like scale that across the teams. So like we're, we're doing that now, even within our teams is there's some individuals, they have no experience with SQL. Probably in the next month, they'll be fine. <laughs> Yeah, and that, that kind of culture of enabling also it plays a super important part. Enabling and mentorship versus like managing and telling, right? Like a lot of the stuff that we work with on our teams is like, here's the why behind what this will enable you to do, or here's the why behind those other parts. Because like for me, if someone doesn't give me the why and they just tell me the what, I'll get pretty pissed off pretty fast. Right. And so when I'm communicating with our teams, I'm like, look, I know you've never touched SQL before. Here's how it unlocks things. And here's how it like is going to make you more like capable in your, in your role to then also like allow you to grow in these ways as well. Right. And here's, here's the way that, that we could help you get there. Right. And just like working with them over and over again to get them to that point. I think that those are two very different approaches that people take versus like, one, someone either just completely opts out. And this is this is specific for small companies, right? Like the value of having two individuals that could at least touch and play with SQL at some capacity is so much greater than like if you're at a large company, you just have a data analytics team, right? And so, yeah, just like working with that piece, you, one person can't opt out and just be like, I don't touch SQL. 
And you're like, do you realize what you could do if you can touch SQL, right? The, the level of communication, the way that you can slice and dice like that data, the insights, and it, it like in, in startups, you have to be able to be both like strategy and execution, right? So there's some times where you're like, yeah, like so-and-so on my team is going to get this to me. Like he's kind of slammed right now. Maybe he'll get to me in two days. Or you're like, no, I actually have a little bit of free time and I'm like super curious about this. And it might take me 15 minutes to just do it, answer the question. And then I can chase it down if it's like, yeah, actually work on this or don't work on that. You could like shelf that, right? Like that, that small piece is huge in a startup when you have like, you know, a really short amount of time that you can actually leverage. That's a... That's awesome. Yeah, just the the perspective that I think our viewers are getting in this episode is is something that usually isn't brought out. How has your like has your process changed? You know, like your, your innate process from like if you were to start up another company tomorrow, let's say, and I'm I'm sure you're using a lot of these skills, you know, in with your your current company, but like. From back then, like, you know, high school Nick, who was thinking about starting, you know, something without going to college to now, like, what are some of those things which you've kind of understood to apply today that you've learned you know, uh, over the years? Pre-launch is the biggest thing. So pre-launching, whether it's a landing page that you hired a Fiverr to do for $35 that looks all pretty like everything's done. It's vaporware and sign up for when it's ready. You you need that market validation before spending time, energy, and effort on this like good idea. Like it's one thing for yourself to think it's a good idea, which is important because you need that confidence to actually want to pursue it. But the market that you're selling to also needs to think it's a good idea, right? Or else it's a hobby. Like if you, if you never make money on something, it's a hobby. It's not a business. So most and startups I, are hobbies. Let's be real. They get funded. I mean, <laughs> have you seen all the D 2 C companies that are tanking because they never actually made money? <laughs> that, that was actually one thing I was thinking about before we, we jumped on this call. I was, you know, thinking about all these companies and like the mentality of like a team, like you like earn the right to do things. Right. And in the same way, if you're joining a startup, you have to earn the right to like, you have to earn the right to live that nine to five, right? And I think too many companies just had all this VC backing. They never got the actual footing correctly identified to where I'm sure a lot of these big companies that like we're seeing just tank right now in the public markets, they have people that are clocking nine, like nine to five in and out. Like they already won. Like there's no sense of urgency. There's no sense of like something's actually wrong, right? Like, there's this huge disconnection or like what you saw on like, like TikTok. So in a startup world, you join and you're like, look, I'm going to be doing everything. Right. And then if like a new team member comes on, you're like, oh my gosh, whew, I don't have to do this. But you see right now, especially with all the layoffs, everyone's like, I'm doing the work of two people and not getting paid more. <laughs> yeah. for and you're like, oh, must be nice. Like, <laughs> Okay, but like, that's the different mentality of those two different individuals, right? Like one of them is like, we've already won. Why am I doing this? Like, it's, it's so much more transactional versus like, no, like we're in the grind. We need to earn the right to win. And this is what we're doing to march towards that piece so that we can actually earn that, earn that part, right? So like, like I, I talk about this in, in personal finance all the time when I'm working with like my friends and stuff. So on the side, I do like, I help a lot of people with like budgeting and like their first credit cards, how to fix credit card, like your credit scores, right? Cause it's just a mathematical equation, like all that kind of stuff. And the first thing I always say is like most people, when they think of their finances, they're celebrating, they celebrate on like the 20 yard line. Like they just scored a touchdown, right? They're like, I just got a job. I haven't got my first paycheck yet, but I'm going to go out to dinner. I'm going to go buy a new car. And I'm like, what? You, you didn't actually do anything yet. Right. And so it's, it's that same mentality that I see carries into the, like the workplace is people pre celebrate at the wrong time where they think they won and they didn't actually win yet. And I think that finding people that understand when and where a true win is are the types of people that you actually want to be around because it, it, it definitely like splits the difference between where you'll be in the long term. 
but it, and that, that it, kind it's of even focus. worse too because it's not just like here's a win it's you take the win and then you turn that win in your head into like something totally different then you go pontificate about that that win and on and then you go raise money on this pseudo win and you're like the ink hasn't even oh there's no ink on, oh so it's just so it's it's pervasive it's pervasive absolutely so for, did you have something too no, no, I was, I think Raj hit, hit it right on the head where, um, you know, I, I, the, the way you said it, like I've, I've felt that way. I've definitely, you know, celebrated wins beforehand and stuff. I think everybody maybe at some point has to, but the way I, like my answer for the same question that, that we just asked you was like around focus, right? Where as you your your energy levels change, we're older than we were back then. Our egos have maybe deflated, you know, a little bit. But you you just kind of have to narrow your field of vision more and more to where okay, if this is what I'm going to be spending the next 10, 15 years of my life on, in the grind, in the trenches with you know my friends or people that I respect, like it it does force you to have a different perspective on things and what you say no to, like. You know, in some cases, like no to that stable job or no to, you know, what your family's asking for, because guess what? You're living the startup life. Like everybody has to come and make those decisions. And when you're in that startup environment, early stage environment, having to make those decisions as part of a team are is a little more, you know, like a regular practice than if you were worried at, you know, at Facebook or working there for however long, you're smart as fuck. And you you add value, but you've been forced into that nine to five or to you know the day in the TikTok life. Many people love that lifestyle, um, and and are able to sustain it. I don't think I would love to do it at some point or another, but I would love to build my company into that kind of culture for not only myself, the way I would want my company to be for others after having gone through, you know, whatever situations, but then also, you know, take pride in the fact that guess what, when this wasn't around, I played a a small part in it. And I think that's that excitement is something all of us have. Yeah. I think we all have these like really, really big goals. Right. And you you might've heard this, it's work today, like no one will. So you can play tomorrow, like no one can. (laughs) <laughs> right and it it takes longer to see that that gra- like it's delayed gratification right to to seeing it but when it starts to kind of peak out you're like oh okay this it starts to it, it starts to be worth it and i mean that like my girlfriend she does she's uh, a lawyer up here in seattle as well right so she's working long hours i'm working long hours in the start of life And the one thing that we always talk about is like, if we're going to do this, make it worth it, right? Like, don't just do this and then end up where you could have been if you were just doing a nine to five. It's like, if you're doing this, be very intentional with your time, energy, and effort. And then, I mean, stuff moves quick, right? Like in three years from now, you're like, oh, hmm, that that escalated quickly. Uh, and I don't is... think people realize how quickly three years comes to your front door. <laughs> it's quick. Uh, it's very, and, very quick. And this coming from a dad of two, I know Nick and I don't have kids yet, but you know, hey, sometime in the that future. You know of, you that know. you know of. <laughs> hey, I'm I'm not as uh, bad of an animal as you think. Um, <laughs> but hey, Funny Nick, guy. this was this is so much fun. Thank you so much for joining us, man. It's, you know, again, I, I love the story. I love the perspective and and. I'm so like, A, I've been super grateful of your time, not only during the startup days, you guys helped us just as much in opening doors and, you know, trying to, or helping us live out our dream and passion at the time. And then even since then, like a lot of my stupid ideas and, you know, anything that I've needed advice on or, or needed your eye on, you've been super available and, and helpful with that. So, so thank you. Raj usually likes to end on a, on a funny question. Well, I mean, it, again, it's just so interesting. You know, it's such a, it's a, it's a, it's a slog. It's just a slog for anybody and everybody. Guy Raz always asks, you know, on a sl- on a scale, percentage wise, luck versus hard work. So I think luck is met at that intersection between being prepared and opportunity, right? 
So I think 99% hard work, 1% luck. I'll take that. I'll take that. Well, hey, Nick, thanks again for joining us. Yeah, like I said, well, actually, how can, if they're founders, you know, listeners to the to the show or to the episode and are like, listen, we need a Nick to help us. Like, how can they find you? And what at what stage do you think, like, you enjoy working with founders? Yeah, definitely. Um, so almost on all socials is at Nick M. Ayala. Um, and then if, second to that, NicholasAyala.com. We'll take you to, to everything as well. And then for the ideal stage, pre-seed seed series A, it's like still lean enough, small enough. And there's a lot of like unknowns where it's, I love just having the opportunity to sit, chat and kind of like, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? Or here are the resources in that area. I think at the, you know, series B kind of phase, hopefully, especially now in, in today's market, you should have product market fit by then. So it's a, you're a, a different set of problems, right? That, that are coming up with that. Well, hey, this was a lot of fun again. Thank you so much for joining us, Nick. And for our viewers, we'll be back again next week with a brand new episode, but stay tuned. Thank you. Thanks guys.